Welcome to the Sanctuary Podcast, hosted by Angel Deer. In this podcast, we explore the mysteries of spirituality and consciousness. In each episode, we dive deep into the realms of human experiences, our rapidly changing world, and the unseen realms, tapping into the universal wisdom that connects us all. Whether you're a seasoned spiritual seeker, starting to awaken to the possibilities of a more expansive reality, or want support on your journey, this podcast is for you. Join me as we explore topics such as shamanism, spiritual transformation, holistic healing, the medicine path, energy healing, plant medicine, ancient wisdom, and more. Our guests are respected elders and experts in their fields, and we'll learn from their insights and experiences as we journey together on the path of spiritual growth. If you can, please consider supporting this podcast by joining our Patreon page at patreon.com slash the sanctuary and why. Once again, it is patreon.com slash the sanctuary and why. Now, let's dive into today's episode. Recognizing your defense mechanisms, right? Just or just having that awareness because if you are having any kind of conflict, and I would say that feeling cold or indifferent is is a version of conflict. Maybe it's not the traumatic version. If any of that is in your relationship, dissatisfaction, recognizing or trying to identify what is your defense mechanism? Like, what is your thing? Maybe it's going cold. Maybe it's getting angry. Maybe it's feeling like a victim. It could be any of the things we mentioned. But identifying it because just having that awareness will bring something where you have a, a different choice. And I would say by having a different choice in your archetypal expression, it has to change your partners, right? If you're not being victim anymore, they can't they can't play perpetrator. Like it's impossible. They don't they don't match anymore. So you'll have to find a new game essentially. In today's episode, I'm meeting a dear friend, Ruin who I've met in Peru and with the husband of my dear friend Nalaya that I've interviewed before on this podcast on Tantra and relationship. Today with Ruan, we explore the context, cultural, historical, and also present of the sacred relationship. Not a term that he used, but the idea that we can develop a much deeper level of intimacy with our partners if we go through certain depth of healing. We can break patterns of running away or conflict and even understand that sometimes conflict doesn't look like screaming and running away but just being cold and not feeling anything or being the stoic one. So there are a lot of things we're exploring today and one of the reasons I brought Ruan is that we are having an amazing uh, retreat in two weeks uh, at the sanctuary where we will bring both of them for couples who wish to go deeper into their relationship, go deeper into connection, go deeper into emotional and physical intimacy, really explore what is in the way of creating this powerful couple but also powerful individual don't don't shy away from their power from their medicine from their knowing and their belief and yet are able to create strong connection and manage the differences that exist between them and their partner so i hope you'll join us at this retreat and if you don't i hope you enjoy the talk today uh a little of fun uh interviewing ron and uh yeah Let's just dive in. I'm really glad to be with you today, uh, listeners to the Sanctuary Podcast, and to be with my friend Rowan. Good morning, Rowan. How are you today? Hey, good morning, Angel. I'm great. How are you? Yeah, I'm very excited, in fact, about that conversation. And... I've known your wife for many, many years. Uh, mm-hmm. In fact, before even you guys even met, uh, because I was a student of her, and I got to discover this topic of relationship, sacred relationship, being in partnership, and how do we step into this container of connection 
with authenticity, with our power, with vulnerability, with strong communication. And I've been really fascinated by the subject. I think, you know, what I want to say before we, we dive in into this conversation is what I've witnessed and what we were talking about is um, very often the healing community uh, or as individuals, you know, we go into our healing on, from a very individualistic perspective, right? About what's, what we need to fix or what we need to change in ourselves. Um, and traditionally, healing was very collective. It was done at a tribe level, at a community level. In fact, we would never really go unless we have a big illness just for our healing. But even in that case, we will look at why this illness appeared in the systems that we are in, right? Is it related to our land? Is it related to our waters? Is it related to our family dynamics, to our ancestors, to, you know, many things that are in the collective? And so the sacred relationship uh theme that we are going to explore today for those of you that are listening to us is really the uh, idea that there might be things that are in the way of us connecting to what we might call our soulmate or ideal partners i, I don't never use the term, term soulmates but many people use it um and what can we do to really uh maybe finally explore a relationship that is more harmonious where there is no patterns of rejections or running away and coming back pushing and pulling that we might experience a lot in relationship and how do we create harmony so i'm excited to discuss all that with everyone and maybe other things that you want to bring on that subject so first let me ask you a little bit about your background and if you can connect it to that theme, right? And why you're here totally. today and what people should know about you. Yeah. And I actually say before I even share about myself, I do think that's the big conflict, especially for people who've worked on themselves, people who are conscious, is the individualism versus collectivism. And a relationship by definition is a collective of at least two people, right? And uh, on that, you know, I think. I started my personal development journey, probably the same reason most people do. I was upset about my life. I had certain anxieties, social anxieties. So relating to people was like actually my biggest focus right in the beginning. Um, I went through many different mini journeys through that. I spent some time in like sexual intimacy, the Tantra world, uh, gained some things. Also, I think gained some negatives from that world when it comes to relationship that we can speak about. And then most recently, I've been and working with men specifically um, with intimacy stuff, but really on life. Uh, I think the virtues that are relevant to men kind of apply universally. I think it's a little bit different for women. Um, we can get into that as well. And I'm a recent father, so family has been a big focus of mine, or it's colored my view of how men should show up in the world, in relationship and family, obviously, but also in society. And I'm also a history buff, and I, I have a side project where I speak about the history of man from a cultural evolutionary perspective. Yeah, and we will dive a bit into that, right? See where we're coming from, really, because we evolved over tens of thousands of years, and now we live a very modern lifestyle that's very different from how we evolved, and we have a lot of traits and behaviors that are connected to this primal and more ancient way of living, right? Totally. Yeah, because I think, you know, a lot of the cultural questions, uh, regardless of which side you are in the modern culture wars, a lot of them are actually easy to, an uh, easy to answer. A lot of people spend so much time in like the abstract world of, you know, philosophizing back and forth, whether it's from a spiritual angle, spiritual bypassing or, you know, citations you see in every argument online, people are using, you know, the same type of arguments back and forth. But if we look at nature and we look at history, and which also means looking at biology, like where, where mm -hmm. we evolved from to becoming these conscious uh, sacks of cells that can have a podcast conversation, you know, it, the answers are there, right? It's not, it's not, a, it's not an abstract thing. As, as much as I love spirituality and looking at the spiritual lenses, you know, it, it's there. We, we, all of our emotions, our tendencies, the good, the ugly have all come from something from some reason. Yeah. And uh, 
I think, you know, one of my um, spiritual teacher, elder uh, that I've been working with for over 15 years told me one day, say, you know, the hardest ceremony of life is relationship, is being in a relationship. <laughs> no, no other ceremony you are going to enter is going to be as hard as that. And it could be a relationship with a partner. It could be a relationship with your child. It could be a relationship maybe with your parents, right? There are many types of relationships, but today we want to focus more on a partner level, right? People partnering together uh, in some forms to, to build a life. So you said you were in the tantric world a little bit and you are a father, you know, I, you have a beautiful child and I got to hang out with, with you guys when I was in Peru and that was so lovely. So uh, what brought you to that subject? I mean, obviously you said you were searching for your own healing, but like specifically about the idea of relating. Uh, as a man, I guess, uh, mm -hmm. but also, you know, what was there for you that you were not finding maybe in, in your education or from your parents or from society? Yeah, I mean, rewinding even like a decade earlier, when I was even 12 to 16, I was very depressed. And a lot of my depression came from what we could maybe call social anxiety now. Then I didn't know what was wrong. I didn't know what to call it, right? I just had a, a lot of issues with communicating. I had a very hard time making friends. And even with my existing friends, I had a hard time feeling like I could express myself. Mm -hmm. So I went through, you know, I searched this is, uh, internet 20 something years ago. So you, there's some dark corners. Um, the first thing that I ended up spending time, like really investing time in was what we now call the pickup community. Because if you were 15 and you searched online for how to not be shy, that's what came up. Um, what is that? I'm curious now. <laughs> oh, you haven't heard of the pickup artist community? No, it's like, tell me uh, more. <laughs> okay. Well, anyway, it's it's a big, you know, it's uh, it started in the early 2000s. Uh, basically, men giving very left-brained advice to other young men on how to okay. date. Uh, so a lot of it and a lot of the thought leaders there were coming from an engineering background and they were trying to break down human interaction with women in a very, uh, yeah, we could say robotic way. And you could find certain success there, but it was like completely lacking in heart and empathy. And nowadays, I'm sure many listeners are familiar, you know, there's been a lot of negative, uh, a lot of accusations of misogyny and other negative things. But in my opinion, really all of that came from the fact that they were trying to apply an engineer's mindset to human connection, which is not, it's not even the most effective way. It's like trying to hear a color. It's like the wrong, it's the wrong sense, right? It's yeah, like we're actually, not machine. That would make things more simple. Maybe sometimes we are a bit yeah. more complex. So actually I had some negatives, even though it did help me break out of my shell when I was like really going on workshops where you go out and talk to a hundred women in a night, it, it was beneficial in some ways because I, it was more people I, I just i spoke to more people than i normally would have uh, at that age um but it came with a lot of negatives too where um i was too in my, in my head i wasn't feeling i had certain other issues that came from basically learning to not feel when you're communicating with someone which is the opposite it's like closing your ears when you're trying to listen to music um so that brought me into the more sexuality focused thing, not necessarily because of sexuality, but because of the emphasis on feeling. Like mm -hmm. I recognized I had some problems because I was thinking too much and feeling too little. Um, and I studied with certain groups. The general Tantra world has a lot of feeling and connection, which is great. Um, something though I'm looking back now from a pretty recent perspective is that while they teach the skill of intimacy and like how to really drop in with a person eye gazing and really connect with someone maybe in the first time you're you're intimate there's something always that has to be withheld in order to do that well like in order to just fully open with a stranger which is a great skill in some settings you have to also be able to protect the part of you that gets triggered when we're in relationships. So you see a lot of those people and so, like a lot of my really good friends are tantric educators this is not to disparage anybody, but I do see a lot of people with this skill very highly developed. They developed it because they were able to protect some part of themselves. And then it all comes out when they're really romantically intimate in a way that maybe is even worse than someone who never took a tantra workshop, maybe in some cases, because they've learned to like hide that 
particularly vulnerable part and open everything else. They've learned to be maybe literally naked in front of strangers because they have detached from whatever natural embarrassment comes from that. I don't know if that's the best example, but like that kind of thing. Yeah, you know? yeah I hear you. Totally. So yeah, so yeah. Yeah. So sacred relationship, how would you define that? And would you apply that to your relationship today? And and maybe what what are the steps? You know, what is it, and 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 how do we really get there? What's in the way? Yeah, and you know that's not a term I use personally, just like soulmate. But it's <laughs> we need to call it something, right? So, uh, actually, my wife and I we've been talking about like what is our, what is like the defining characteristic of the relationship we want to strive for, and it's actually the thing that we've already mentioned: this individualism versus collectivism. I think a lot of people, especially free spirits, feel they have to compromise too much in a relationship. Or I mean, this is just a general thing. Mm-hmm. A lot of that just is the a general belief in society that you have to lose some of yourself. And for us, we wanted to find a way where that's not in conflict. The c- extreme opposite being relationship is where you get to be yourself the most. In fact, you get to be yourself in a healthy relationship. You get to be yourself and maybe discover great parts of yourself that maybe you couldn't even do as an isolated individual, you know? Mm. And that's what we strive for, at least as an ideal. Mm. I like that. I like that definition. So what are some of the good, let's start by the good first, the the good indicator that, you know, that relationship is, I don't know, balanced, healthy. uh, Well, what are the things you look at or you explore? And I'm guessing in your own relationship where you say, well, this, those are a good indicator that there is mm-hmm. some strengths there. Uh, and that you say, well, yeah, this is uh, the work we've been doing, right? This is, I know when I do that or when we're able to maybe even argue together, right? To have mm-hmm. conflict to a certain degree. Uh, that for me is a sign that it's a healthy relationship. So what, what are those, those signs or the things you we look at when we talk about yeah. relationship or good partnership? Well, let's say. Starting with like really concrete things that I do that I do like monitor regularly is how much we laugh together. Uh, when we come back together after being physically apart, is there excitement there? Um, and even actually, I, I just thought of this now because you brought up fighting. It's like when we argue, which is natural. Uh, I still see her as beautiful in the middle of the argument. Like that to me is like that to me is a sign that even though we're arguing the relationships in a very good place, like if I have that perception of myself and then on a more zoomed out level, you know, looking at your life together compared to before seeing that you get to do more things you get, I mean, as a person, you're expressing yourself more, you know, compared to obviously the, the negative is easier to observe. Like, if you compare your single life to your relationship life and you're less expressive, you're less funny, you're less uh, happy, obviously, that's that's obviously not not a good thing. It's the negative side. So striving for the opposite of that. Yeah. So, so you know, my experience and also uh, as a personal experience in my life, but also as witnessing with my clients or in our community is that I feel we are living in a world that's very polarized, right? People have very strong opinions and belief systems. Um, There is not always a lot of flexibility around that. And I feel that or witness that every time conflict arise, people have a tendency, a quick tendency to just leave the space, right? That we cannot be in spaces if there is disagreements. Right. And I feel somehow it has increased the polarization because then people just hang out with whoever they feel is aligned, you know, with their belief system, with their values and all of that. And I feel somehow it's preventing us to really unite as a collective. Mm-hmm. But why I'm bringing that is that I often see that in individuals that also have a very hard time to be in relationship. To being committed, I'm talking long-term relationship, right? And maybe some people say, well, you know, I'm not for relationship. I want to be single all my life. I'm a free spirit or independent spirit, right? But I feel there's kind of a correlation in our capacity to be with discomfort, to be with an opinion that's different than ours, and our capacity to, at the same time, staying connected with ourselves and with the other person. For me, the greatest difficulty, I guess, you know, is how do I stay engaged? 
with someone that I disagree with. Could be my wife, could be you know, whoever it is, right? If there is a strong arguments or difference of opinion, how do I choose love and connection over what you were mentioning earlier, which is what I believe in or why I am or my power. I mean, the however I define it, right? So there is kind of tension here, right? Yeah, you know, I think uh, one of the troubles with modern life is that since we spend so much time online and for the first time in history, we have access to everyone. There's almost this paradox of choice, which you see a lot when people are dating a lot. They say they want a relationship and then they never find one. It's because they have a hundred other Tinder matches that they could go to if there's even a slight inconvenience with the person they're with. And then when you look at relationship, there's something like this where, you know, people a lot of times it's it's like attachment chemicals that keep someone in a relationship and once those fade or something challenges them they're immediately thinking about someone else where i was just i was just speaking to to some of my clients uh some guys on this is that it's pretty this is the first time in human history where a man can even observe more than 100 women in his lifetime like most of human history most men maybe met 100 women maybe not even 100 women their entire life so like it was just that there was a, a natural appreciation for every single person you met because there was like there literally wasn't that many. Whereas now, just the idea that there's so many options out there disincentivize like working through discomfort, as you said. And you can see this on many levels, even outside of relationship. Like, you know, we're alternative as a family. We want to live in a communal setting as almost all, of, I think, spiritual or people in, interested in nature. like This is like a very common hippie thing, right? You want to live in community on land with all your friends. And we've met so many families like this. But it's, when it actually comes to anything inconvenient, be it money, be it how to live, it never works out. I, I mean, it rarely works out, right? Maybe 1% of groups of friends who say this, this works out. Because once there's a disagreement, it's like, well, we're not bonded by blood. We're just going to go to the next community and you just move. Like it's like there's nothing really tying us. Whereas in say a paleolithic environment, we wouldn't have a choice. We would need each other so much that if someone annoys someone else, you figure out how to make it work. Like this is something you see in like stories of uh, tribal settings, like forgiveness is so it's such a big thing and sometimes ritualized because you need each other. You can't kick someone out over some, you know, he made a mistake. Like you have to make things work. And mm -hmm bring this back to relationship, you know, the, the big extreme opposite of today would be say the arranged marriage, which is often seen as this oppressive thing. And maybe it's not something I would necessarily want or employ on my daughter, let's say. Um, but there is something if you look at like some of the more ancient stories of Tantra's origin, it, this, this skill of learning to drop in with someone and learning to love the person in front of you you know, where nowadays it's in an eye gazing ceremony, but it, it was based on the idea that maybe you don't get to choose who you're with and you just have to be with this person. And then there's certain skills that are beautiful to learn where you don't have an option to leave. You have to find a way to make this work and make this happy for both of us. Um, so yeah, I think we've gone a little bit too far, obviously in the choice and globalization, let's say of, of how we relate to people. And I think, I, I do feel like culture is contracting right now it's contracting to a more conservative like as an adjective conservative state because people are realizing we've got a little bit too far and anything goes a little bit too far in individualism and whether it's family society or especially relationship we could learn a lot more to collectivize let's say mm -hmm. to, to at the very least to be in the same reality as our partner which is i i was which is how i would define connection like to really you see the world for the most part in the same way. You evaluate reality together in the same way, which includes within the relationship, right? Most fights are disagreement over what's true. And this is true yeah. of all arguments, actually, right? And if yeah, you, all, and very or very small things, right? People often break up for like a, a tiny detail. Yeah. Sometimes we say over the toilet paper or the toilet seats or you know whatever the, that little things that annoys people every day. Uh, but that that's true. I want to come back on what we were saying in terms of evolution, right? If if 50,000 years ago, or even not that long ago, 10,000 years ago, right? We were to kick someone out of the community or we wanted to leave. It was death, right? You would probably die in the wild or you will, without your community, you will not be able to survive. So there was no possibility. But there's also community today 
uh, in many ways that I've met and, and spent time with that still live that way. And there's still a possibility to live now, you know, nowadays, either it's in jungle in Peru or in the mountainous communities. But there is such commitment to that family. And when I say family, I say beyond the traditional family unit, right? That includes all the elders in the community and the, the aunt and the aunties and, you know, children in those communities, they call grandpa or father or mother, people that are not genetically their father or their mother or their grandfather because... They are the elders and they are holding all the children's, right? Or they are the parents and they are taking care of all the children's. And there is still a choice to stay there, right? Because people value that type of life. And in my experience, what I've seen is much more regulated children, much more happy relationships and communities because there is that commitment and that understanding that we are in it together, right? And we are going to need each other. So how do we do that? We don't, we don't really live that way. For most people, I'm sure listening, you know, mm-hmm. we live in a very different environment and we are very much like spoiled child, right? Everything is available, right? I can eat any food I want. And like you said, well, I can find another partner. I can find another woman. I can find another man, right? Whatever I'm looking for, because there is so much choice. So how do we feel into those values and this kind of different way of relating and how do we nurture that given maybe we don't have to right or some people are like yeah, well maybe there is a certain level of unhappiness when we keep jumping from one relationship to another or one community to another and i've seen that a lot often but we might not want to wait to be in our 50s or 60s and to feel really lonely to realize oh i should have cultivated that relationship right so how do we do that what's the process yeah actually my my answer you, you just said it it's recogni- for me at least it's recognizing i'm going to die because what you just said that dilemma it's in everything right like if you're into nature if you're into exercise if you're into physical health all of the tips you see right now are reminding you to do less convenient things that technology can do for us whether it's like earthing or going hiking or most extras like i'm really into like natural movement all of it is things that you would normally do if we didn't have cars like climbing walking you know it's and but now in the first world in 21st century you have to remind you have to have a a device on you that reminds you to walk every day right (laughs) like you have to do all these things you have to go out of your way you know i was trying to um hack my sleep a few months ago so i was sleeping in a tent as opposed to the warm bed you know it's like and it doesn't make sense. Like my, my friends would tease me, uh, I, but, and it doesn't make sense, honestly, when there's something better, but we have to make this constant choice. But the thing is with relationship, let's say, recognizing that you could save yourself from the inconvenience. You can save yourself from the work, so to speak, mm-hmm. by going to the next one. In every individual moment, the truth is to look at it rationally. It does make sense. Right. So someone smells a little funny. Someone is has a reaction to things you don't like. Someone has a, like a micro trauma that is inconvenient to you. Go to the next relationship. And like so many people have done that. I've done that for a lot of my life. But if you recognize that one day you're going to be maybe too old to enjoy the things you want to enjoy with a partner, that, I think that's the only thing. Because at every age, no matter what, what like assuming you're not about to die, it actually is kind of a rational choice if you look at it just in the short term. Yeah. Yeah. And I want to explore, you know, an, another part of that topic, which for me is something that's very alive because something I witness all the time is that the connection between personal trauma and our capacity to relate and to connect, you know, very often, I see people that say, well, this, this didn't work for me anymore. You know, it could be a relationship. It could be a community or this, I had the intuition or I had the guidance or I had spirit told me, right? <laughs> I need to do that. And in fact, when you have a little bit of trauma informed background in psychology and in how the body react, when you carry trauma, you are going to very often read the world from that place, right? from that Mm -hmm. fear place or from that place of protection and safety, which is, you know, what trauma is, right? It's creating a story in the present from something that's happening in the past. And very often those are very hard 
um, parts of us to access, to really see that maybe that pattern or that belief system, even that identity, you know, that, oh, maybe I'm just a loner or I'm just, I want to be single and all of that. In fact, it's coming, it's coming from trauma, but not from our true nature and something deeper in us that's really craving relating, craving intimacy. And yeah, I wonder if it's something that you have experienced or that you see where we have this tendency to read because I feel, you know, in a world that's quite mm -hmm. violent and oppressive and there is a lot of that. And people sometimes have a very hard time reading into what their decision or where the decision are coming from, right? Or what their patterns are coming from, especially in relationships. Totally. Uh, yeah, I mean, ultimately, every not good thing that we do with our partners, like everything that's like hurtful or harmful or, you know, trauma based, it's to protect ourselves, right? For some reason, we picked up, we have to protect ourselves. We have to protect ourselves in intimate moments, whether it's from childhood or whatever. And then it comes out. And I think, you know, at least looking at it from maybe a more rational perspective, this is one of the benefits, I guess, of maybe having multiple relationships through your life is that if you've done this exact same thing, you know, if you could be honest with yourself to recognize you've done this before, that's pretty much a sign that it's something coming from you. And it could be in your choice of partner. It could be how, what you incite in the other person. This is one thing that I think, you know, when I hear about a lot of pop psychology, like now I think one of the trending topics is, oh, is this person a narcissist? Like, it, like I see a lot of that now. It's like labeling the other person, labeling yourself. I'm an avoidant, you know, I'm a fearful, anxious, you know, everyone likes these labels. Like there's a tendency to say, this empath, is how I am. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and uh, in reality, and this is more of the Jungian perspective, our personalities are, are, uh, are like a, a bunch of different mini programs, you know, like this, the, the basic idea of archetypes essentially is like, we have all of these things in us, right? And they get activated in different ways, which is why the way you behave with your parents is different than your coworkers is different than your lover, et cetera. And I, uh, a lot of how we behave, especially in intimate relationship, when the things that come out of us would never come out of us in any other place, it's usually because, you know, you know, let's say my wounded boy <clears throat> is going to attract the overbearing mother and my partner and they, they connect or the opposite, right? Like my stern father and her, <clears throat> uh, her little girl are going to find each other. Like these things, they, they have pairs, right? They, in fact, they develop because of some other time in our life, whether it's a protection mechanism or aggression or victim mentality, like they didn't come out of nowhere and then they find each other. It's like my, my inner child isn't going to come out at the same time as her inner child because those two things don't fit. So I think looking at it from an archetypal perspective, I'm not sure this is answering your question, but it's, uh, it's very useful. I think mm -hmm. of like, okay, we're, we're playing a game right now where we're playing, like we're playing, we're playing these roles. We're like, we're doing a little theater right now. And it's obviously very difficult in the moment of intimacy or moment of conflict. But if you could zoom out or when things have calmed down and recognize, okay, this is the dynamic we're playing. Well, maybe we can choose a different dynamic. And so especially when it comes to trauma real, informed. Is that what many people very often call soulmate? Is just basically those wounded parts that are reflecting each other and attached to each other. And it can feel really good because it can feel safe. But basically, we keep protecting a part or repeating a role and a play without being completely unconscious of it. I mean, not that it's always the case, but I feel it's often the case when we use those terms, like we feel they're totally. really strong there. Right. But maybe it's from there. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it feels familiar, right? right? Like, you know, when we spend time with a little kid, which I've been spending a lot of time now with like little babies love repetition and even young children, they love repetition. They want to see the same movie over and over again. It reinforces something. They're building a pathway in their brain uh, that will, you know, the movie, you know, I saw the Lion King 500 times as a kid. Like it always has a special place in my heart and every single image from that movie is recognizable. And it, it brings me back to some feeling, even though I don't, I'm not entertained by it. And the same thing with every, everything that has been like repeated into ourselves and when we are repeating, say, a victim perpetrator dynamic that happens a lot in both directions, often in a relationship, especially when we're fighting, we're for some reason wanting to hit that button again. And I think it becomes very interesting. And there's not one answer. It's like, why are we hitting the victim button again as a 
40 year old man? Like, why am I, why am I hitting this like wounded boy thing? And, and, you know, this may be many answers to this, but one could be, okay, this part of you has not been resolved. Like you're still carrying trauma. There's obviously many roots to healing that kind of thing. But I think, you know, with stuff like this, just recognizing that's what's happening, just like admitting it, I think it's huge, actually, just like being like, oh, okay, maybe not in the moment when you're in your boy and whining, that's not recognizable, but maybe a second later, or I think part of what consciousness is, is having like a shorter time delay before like, oh, yeah, two minutes ago, I was being a little boy. (laughs) And the closer that gets to zero time, I mean, once it gets to zero time, then you have control. Yeah, it's not already in fact controlling it. It's just first being aware of it, right? It's like, Mm -hmm. oh, yes, this is what's happening here. You know, and maybe I have no hold on it. And maybe next time it's going to get triggered and again and again and again. But like you say, maybe it's not going to come as often because if I'm making me aware of it, or it's not going to pass for like a whole week before I realize this is what happened last week. Totally. This is who yeah. was there. In fact, you were not my wife. You were my mother in that scenario. And I was angry, you know, and I was five, right? So. Yeah. Because once you get to noticing it almost in real time, then you have choice. Like you wouldn't choose to be a little boy, you know, in your relation, you know, maybe not, no, never, like you wouldn't choose it. So it only happens when you basically lose consciousness for some period of time. And then you go into some dynamic that you wouldn't choose if you were conscious. So can I ask you a vulnerable question? Oh well, yeah, sure. The question is possible. So <laughs> what is your pattern? What is the one you say like, no, that's the one I really go to and, and you know where it's coming from. And, you know, maybe we can give an example there and say, yeah, this is when you show up for me. That's how I do. That's how I shrink or, yeah. I, mold, or I get young, right? Yeah, well, we, uh, Nalai and I, we've had this discussion a bunch the last couple of weeks. So it's, uh, I think we both have a version of martyrdom. Like we do things that we don't mean. And it comes out a little bit differently for both of us, but I'll say for myself, like I'll do extra because, oh, I have to do this because the family needs it or she's in a bad place, but I don't really want to do it. Uh And then it's building up some resentment that I'm going to bring out later. I'm like, oh, well, I did all this stuff. I had to take a day off work today because of your needs. And like, it's like thrown back at her later. And, um, and actually, even on a deeper level, I, one of the reasons why we came up with the definition that I mentioned of like a sacred relationship or an ideal relationship is uh, part of mine, at least, is this idea of like, oh, I need to make myself small to accommodate my partner. And it's part of this martyr thing of like, oh, this relationship wouldn't work unless I gave up some of my desires. And, and then obviously, that's not good for the relationship, even to even have like anything resembling that thought. Um, so. Yeah, that's 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 my thing that I'm still like identifying and uh, as it comes up. Yeah. So is it like compromise? You know, I feel a lot of time, you know, people think of relationships when you ask, oh, what did it last? Well, I just compromise. Right. So that but when we are compromised, it's like this idea of making myself smaller. Right. So I, I, I'm not going maybe to voice my whole needs uh, to take mm-hmm. all what I really want because I'm also in charge of nurturing this relationship, that other person and the relationship. How do you see that idea of compromise? And I know one of part of your work is to really step into your power and to not shy away of who you are, right? To be really this powerful individual and yet not to be individualistic, to be in relationship in that power. And I feel sometimes even when I think of it for myself, it's like, oh, is it not going to conflict if I do that? Don't I need to sometime bring love to just step down and to give space? Uh, w- what do you think of that? I would love to hear a bit. Your, yeah, your it's actually something I'm still working through is like, what is my actual model of this? But I'll, I'll tell you the phases I've gone through, which I don't see it as anymore. It's like, there's the kind of conventional normie view, let's say, of relationship where you have to compromise. Like, oh, life ends. It's like you see this with uh, children also, like when a a lot of the common uh, verbiage is, oh, your life is over. You know, it's like, you know, same thing with like marriage. Oh, your life is over now. Like you're all the fun. It's gone, which is really an unfortunate thing. Like if if someone actually believes that, I wonder why they would ever actually get married. Right. It just seems so unpleasant. Right. Um, but then there's, you know, when I was in, you know, a more individualistic 
personal development, spiritual phase, which I think is a good phase, or at least it was useful for me. Um, there's the extreme belief, the opposite of like, I'm going to do everything I want. I'm not going to, I remember even arguing over the word compromise with an ex partner. I'm never going to compromise. Like a relationship doesn't work if any person compromises. So we can't ever compromise. And then you have a lot of people, you know, you see this a lot boldly declaring their desires as if almost from a child perspective of like, oh, well, this has to happen. Otherwise I'm leaving. That's kind of almost the underlying thing. And, And now I'm seeing that as we've been speaking about, there is a collective element, right? So I'll, I'll use an analogy from my work with men. It's like, uh, when a man is really in his masculine, so to speak, there are parts of it that is unpleasant, right? Culture is labeling it as toxic, right? There's things like aggression, there the things that are natural, even in little boys, and especially in young men when they go through puberty, that are kind of inconvenient to the rest of the tribe. But it has a clear place, right? Um, earlier tribes would have a rite of passage where it became very clear where his aggression goes. So he wouldn't have this, he wouldn't, he wouldn't go around punching people because someone would hand him a weapon or a tool or a hunting, go hunting with a man, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it was like, this is where your aggression goes. And he would feel fulfilled because that need was fully expressed in a way that actually was beneficial to the tribe. And, you know, bringing this into relationship, I feel like that is part of it, finding where all of your tendencies fit. And then also, I do think, even though I don't believe in soulmates necessarily, and and I think men and women, neurotypical men and women are never going to see the world the same way. Like our brains are different, our hormones are different, our tendencies are different. But for like a, a mini example, like my wife and I don't agree on everything, but we also don't care about the same things. Like if she wants to paint the house pink, I really don't care. It's not what I would choose. But even though we disagree like the way we weight those things are completely different. So I'm totally happy for her to make those decisions. And there's not a, really a conflict. And like, this is kind of moving into what I am now reforming as my ideal view of relationship of like, in a healthy relationship, each person is fully expressing the things that actually matter to them. And ideally, they don't conflict. And I think maybe, maybe, maybe in a few years, I'll change that view of like, okay, well, that's not possible either. I don't know, <laughs> to be honest, just looking at the way my beliefs have changed, but that's the way I would like to think about it. Like one thing I, I saw during when the pandemic started in, in couples I've coached is that things that never seem to matter as far as like, say, disagreeing about how the world should be run or mandates or whatever, all these hot button topics that are new, you know, some couples turned out that they agreed on everything and that was great. And then some couples found out for the first time in their relationship that they really strongly view the world differently, which is an unfortunate thing to find out eight years into a relationship, right? It's like, Mm -hmm. yeah, it's too bad that didn't come up on the second date or somehow, because now there's something that really does matter where they conflict. Whereas I think it's natural to view the world differently. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I know, in fact, friends that have separated after many years together because the disagreed on the COVID vaccine, right? They are two very different strong opinions and somehow it ended up being a long arguments over many months. And then they realized that somehow because of that, they had a different view of the world. I'm not sure if that's true, that's true right? That's what's really what was happening, but that brought up this time together because you have to be with each other for so long. And they were living in New York City, so they could not really leave their mm-hmm. apartment for a very long time that brought something much, much deeper. But isn't it the case, like the longer we're going to stay with someone, the more we are going to start accessing things that have been really buried that Mm -hmm. we cannot see after one month of dating. We cannot see if we're not in deep, long, committed partnership. And that might feel like life-threatening because those things are usually very well protected for a reason. Yeah. And, you know, on that note, like with you know, my definition of connection being basically in the same reality, uh, you know, people, as you're saying, like defend their realities, right? This is where all of the political arguments come from. It's like, if you're questioning my reality, now I feel unstable as a human being. And it, and and it's quite difficult for most people to accept that there are other ways to view the world, right? Like maybe 80% of people arguing on the, maybe all people arguing on the internet just can't accept this idea, right? They want to somehow destroy the other, the other argument. Um, and, you know, in relationship, 
I, my wife and I will always see certain things very differently. Like she's into spiritual things that I'm not. I'm into various things that she finds incredibly boring and doesn't care. But as long as the things that we're looking at together, whether it's something in society or a moral value, or even sometimes like when it comes to cohabitation, like how you want to eat, you know, I've had to separate from uh, partners because we just like viewed nutrition so differently. And like, it's something so important to me and it wasn't important to them, but they wouldn't budge. They wouldn't stop, you know, they wouldn't change their diet. And I do think those things like kind of have to fit, which is where finding, you know, if there is an idea of the one, it's the person who fits your value system enough where you're not having conflict on important things. Because even on the flip side, when the pandemic started, I know couples who viewed vaccines differently, but one person didn't really care that much. So it didn't become Mm -hmm. a, like one person thought like, oh, this has to happen. The other one was like, okay, (laughs) you know, and as long as there's some balance with that, I think it's totally fine. Yeah. I mean, my my wife and I have a slightly different opinion about it, right? And yeah, we didn't separate because of that. Well, we didn't think, okay, you know, we should not agree with that. We we see, you know, something slightly different. And I ultimately think that when, you know, we have very extreme or different opinions, the truth is probably in between the two, right? N- neither me nor her <laughs> on the real ultimate truth. What does that mean? And maybe, you know, we are both just trying to attach a lot of value sometime on on a certain topic right but like you said certain topic may be key right mm-hmm. about like nutrition was for you with that partner right or it yeah. could be a certain political ideal or a certain view of seeing the world sometimes there is things that may be well that's really a deal breaker because there's really a misalignment on how we see the world right yeah and i think a lot of things this goes for culture and for like relationships Maybe there is no objective truth, right? Like, you know, if you look at how the common views change every generation, yeah. you know, and, and you know, when I when I think of culture, I'm thinking more on the society level. A lot of things, a lot of what people believe are right and wrong are kind of like which side of the street should you drive on? Like it actually doesn't matter as long as we all agree to drive on the same side so we don't crash. Like everything else, like whether, you know, it doesn't actually matter. <laughs> and I think this is true in politics, a lot of politics, and maybe not all things. And many things when it comes to relationship, like whether you eat hot dogs or not, as long as you agree, who cares? Really? Yeah. yeah. I still find it weird when people drive on the left side, but that's okay. <laughs> They're wrong. <laughs> They're wrong. <laughs> okay. So um, let's talk a little bit about, so you and Alaya are going to come in a few weeks at the sanctuary to offer a, a deep dive into all the amazing tools that you've learned the past, the past 10, 15 years separately and together around sacred partnership, around relationship, around Tantra and other elements of that. Um, And, you know, it might be more retreats in the fall coming up. So can you just give us a little snippet into some of the tools or maybe some exercise that even people that might not come to this retreat and are listening today might find interesting to research about or to learn about? To in order to foster a better relationship, to foster that sacredness of connection between human beings. Totally. And again, I want to say like our goal with this workshop is our goal in our own relationship and our definition of good relationship, sacred relationship, ideal partnership, which is in the relationship, you get to be yourself the most. Mm. And, and I do want to add that self might be different than the self, your best self when you were single or in previous relationships before but it is, you know, it is like a flourishing of yourself so that there's no conflict in the relationship. Um, so in the three days that we're, we're going to have, uh, it's focused on couples, right? It's not for just practicing intimacy exercises with a stranger. It's uh, for existing couples. The first day is going to be focused on clearing those defense mechanisms that we picked up, those traumas or micro traumas that we picked up from past relationships or maybe our childhood where we learn to protect a part of ourselves, which usually comes out in a negative way in our partner and usually triggers their defense mechanism. So the first day is focus on breaking that negative feedback loop where we identify defense mechanisms, where we break them down. Uh, The second day is more focused on certain exercises we picked up from both of our time in the Tantra worlds where we're translating certain physical practices into uh, really creating union 
with maybe a mini goal of like having the kind of physical passion that you had when you were falling in love, which for a lot of people dies away. And there is a part of that day where we're going to separate the men and women to like really find their individual power, if you will, Mm -hmm. their polarity, if you will, to come together as full beings. And the third day is an integration day with co-creating reality, which is the other thing we spoke about today is where, you know, can you have the same vision and build a vision together? Because if you look at the evolutionary purpose of why we care to have a partner, why any of those things are interesting, it is to create more life, whether you choose to have literal children or or not, it's creating life together in a way that a a single person literally physically cannot do. Um, So yeah, that's what, that's the focus of the weekend. We're very excited to share different tools and um, yeah, meet some awesome couples who want to go in that direction. That's beautiful. So before we, we close, you know, as there's some people here listening, uh, we have thousands of listeners on our podcast. So is there maybe one or two or three things, uh, technique or kind of tips, things that people that are looking maybe to improve their relationship could explore or do what I would be even say, well, that's the one thing you need to do or the two things you need to do uh, to really, you know, improve relationship and, and dive deeper together. Is there something like that? Or there's not, <laughs> there's just hundreds of them. <laughs> well, there's a lot of things, but I'll go backwards in our conversation today. Cause I think some good things came out, uh, which is, um, Uh, and I, I would say another thing would be, and this might be just a discussion for everyone in a relationship to have with their partner is what is your co-created vision for the now and for the future? I think it's a very fun topic, especially if you've been having unfun discussions or, or maybe things haven't been so interesting in your relationship. Like, uh, you know, we call it, uh, you know, dream time. Like it's something we do after the baby goes to bed. Like we, or we'll say like, oh, you want to dream together? And we just like, imagine what we want to do in the next month and the next year. And just having, you know, that is as defined a shared reality that you can have your vision for your life together. That is beautiful. I love that. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I feel that we've done that a few times together and I was my partner and it's been so amazing, right? Because maybe we had a conflict the day before or that same day. And then we talk about our big dreams and we realize they're so aligned and we're get so excited to do it together that it kind of brings us back into connection sometimes just kind of opening the space right beyond maybe the one thing that triggered us right uh, that brought us there yeah and i think you know we didn't speak about the differences between men and women too much but i in my experience at least that's something that tends to really matter for women it's like oh they're included in the shared vision and like that's at least all I'll say for my in my relationship, this is true, where it's like a really strong, um, almost like reconfirmation of love, like that we're sharing a, like a, an envisioned future together. And it just makes you feel closer and it's great. And maybe in some relationships, the opposite dynamic, I guess it is not necessarily gendered, but, you know, I think it's just really great for uh, reaffirming love. Mm, beautiful. Thank you, brother. Thank you for yeah, thanks, Angel. your time today. There is so much more. There's so many things to explore. But yeah, so we are going to have this retreat uh, in a couple of weeks. Uh, if you feel interested, I really recommend to come because Nala and Ruan just flew uh, from Mexico and they were in Peru mm-hmm. before and they are going to be in the US for a little time. So I highly recommend being there if you can. And if not, you know, you can ch- check the link that I will put under this podcast and this video about the websites that uh, Ruan's work does. 
And if you're a man, you can check that. And if you're a woman, maybe you want to work with Nalaya, with his wife. Uh, but definitely, and I'm sure you guys are preparing some kind of offering together, right? Where we can do some online work with the two of you, no? Possibly. Like we're focused on this retreat right now, but okay. maybe in the future. I'm planning a seat there. <laughs> I'm <laughs> hoping that will happen. Thank you so much, brother. Thank you for the time. Thank you for sharing your insight, for being uh, really authentic and grounded. I really appreciate that. It's refreshing and it feels really nice uh, to find that. Uh, and also, uh, yeah, opening our mind, our hearts, our souls to, you know, to really be uh, vulnerable and I guess radically honest with ourselves about what's really happening. And that's something I, I really, uh, really love um, that you carry as medicine and that you hopefully people felt today when they listened to you. Thank you. Yeah, it was really fun. Thanks for having yeah. me. Thank you, everyone. So you can find you know, all the details on the retreats and events, as usual, on our website, thesanctuaryheal.com. And uh, well, we look forward to seeing you soon again. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye, everyone. Ciao. Thank you for listening to The Sanctuary Podcast. We deeply value your support. Please consider sharing this podcast with others and joining our Patreon page at patreon.com slash the sanctuary and why. Once again, it is patreon.com slash the sanctuary and why. At the sanctuary, we believe that spirituality is a personal journey that takes many forms, and we honor and respect all paths to awakening and the rise of consciousness. Our mission is to provide a platform for open and honest conversations about spirituality and to inspire and empower our listeners to live their most authentic lives in good relation to each other's, the living and invisible worlds. I look forward to connecting with you again here or at our events, retreats, and online gatherings. You can find all our offerings at thesanctuaryheal.com. Once again, it is thesanctuaryheal.com.